school to be within 10 percent plus or minus of the racial makeup of the district as a whole. So for instance, if you have a district that is 70 percent white and 30 percent African American, then every school has to be between essentially 20 and 40 percent African American and 60 and 80 percent white. So what, any combination in there is okay. Um, in addition, the faculty has to have that same thing. If the faculty makeup is, and this was um, about, about the numbers, 80% uh, white and 20% African American, then so too the faculty in each school must be within uh, plus or minus 10% of that makeup. So that was part of the Shelby County Schools plan. And the Shelby County Schools litigation doesn't take the turn towards busing. Rather, um, it sort of settles into, after 1971, a um, situation where it's moving, uh, the plaintiffs and the defendant are sort of working together and the court is, uh, it's described later as rubber stamping uh, the decisions that are being made. Okay, so just sort of finishing the uh, school desex stories. Memphis, uh, in 1982, modifies, this is the most significant modification of Plan Z. This is where um, some bus routes are changed to reflect the new racial demographics of the system. You know, Plan Z was now busing African American students to African American schools and it didn't make any sense any longer. Um, in addition, optional schools are endorsed in 1982 for the first time. This is a way to sort of stem the departure of white students. Um, that continues court, um, court uh, oversight continues through 1992 when the case is put on inactive status and it's eventually dismissed in 1997. Not dismissed because suddenly we had integrated schools, dismissed because to the maximum extent practicable in a now nearly 85% um, African American district, there could be no more integration. It's, it's impossible to spread. Um, at that point, about 10% of the population being white. It's impossible to spread that population um, enough to get to any sort of meaningful integration in any school. Um, Shelby County Schools follows um, a similar sort of, uh, well, not really similar, it follows its own path. In the 1980s, um, the court is supervising construction decisions because now the Shelby County Schools is growing, uh, and we'll talk about in how much they're growing. Um, and so you see court oversight of, of construction decisions. And in addition, uh, you see in, eight, in 1989 a sort of increased focus on faculty uh, desegregation in the county schools. There was concern that recruitment of minority faculty members had stalled at, as of 1989. And the, the result was uh, an increase in reporting requirements on faculty recruitment at that time. In 2006, the Robinson plaintiffs and uh, the Shelby County School Board came to the district court and said, we believe that the district has now achieved unitary status. We asked for a dismissal. The district court um, rejected, partially rejected that um, position and said that uh, it has not yet been achieved in terms of student or faculty uh, integration and ordered sort of a, a new version of the racial makeup test that had previously been the order. So now it was a plus or minus 20% uh, requirement in each school. So it was reflective of the district as a whole. However, the Sixth Circuit uh, reverses that. And in 2009, the Shelby County schools are declared uh, unitary and Robinson is dismissed. So in both districts, we exist now in a world where desegregation is over. The cases have been uh, dismissed. Now, what I want to do here uh, briefly is talk about how the schools have the schools and the systems have changed since Brown, since the time of Brown. And I just want to bring your attention to a couple of numbers up here. Uh, if you look at acreage on the first line outside of Memphis, so you heard uh, John Thomason talk a lot about annexation, right? Annexation of White Haven. Well, annexation is happening throughout this time period, and it's impacting the boundary lines of the city and with, with that, the school system. So you can see in 1950, only 104 acres were Memphis. 650 acres were non-Memphis. By uh, 1970, 
Memphis has more than doubled in size to 217 acres, and pretty much by today, it's up to 295 uh, acres uh, and 460 in outside of Memphis. So the jurisdiction of the Shelby County Schools is shrinking. At the same time, the population of Shelby County is not shrinking, it is growing. So look uh, in particular at population of, uh, this is outside of Memphis, so I'm on the total population in the yellow part. Uh, 1970, there's 98,000 non-Memphians in Shelby County. In 2010, there's 238,000 non-Memphians in Shelby County. This is um, suburban sprawl, growth explosion outside of uh, the city center. If you look at the student populations, the, the two things to sort of note are here, 81% in 1970, 81% of public school students uh, attended the Memphis City Schools, which means 19% attended the Shelby County Schools. Now, uh, only 69%. So this county is growing in its, uh, the county school system is growing in its share of the total public school um, population. In addition, if you look at the student density, and I, I know it's a bunch of numbers and you know it's a CLE thing, but uh, <laughs> I, think it, I think it does illustrate. Um, the student density, so this is uh, looking at the student population number and the acreage numbers. 679 students per acre in the Memphis City Schools in 1970, only 351. This is because the student population is shrinking. Uh, it's down from 147 to 103. But this number is, is probably more important. 65 students per acre in the Shelby County Schools, 103 in 1970, 103 students per acre in the Memphis City Schools. So what's happening is um, the city, the suburban schools are starting to look on some level more like the, um, the inner city schools, the, the, the urban schools. Um, and, I, and what, the main difference is, if you imagine 1950, Shelby County is rural. It's agricultural, uh, the non-Memphis portion of, of Shelby County. Um, today, it's not. There are, there are areas of it, but the population centers um, are urban, right? They're not farmland. And so th it's a very different situation um, that the school systems live in. And there you see the sort of current boundary lines of the two school systems, right? The, the city schools are uh, coterminous with the uh, city limits. I'm going to just let you know that there is information in your sheet that uh, talks about the uh, current situation, the current uh, makeup racially, uh, socioeconomically of, this, of the two school systems. I'm not going to spend any time going through it. In addition here, it's, it's also in the sheet, um, some information on funding, graduation rates, uh, no child left behind, uh, schools in good standing. You can see that number, 90% 90, 90, uh, of Shelby County schools in good standing, 40% uh, of Memphis City schools. So it's uh, clearly a different uh, type of school system. Here, I do want to talk a little, I, I, again, this is in the packet, but it's funding. So where does the funding for the two school systems come from? And this is where we're going to start transitioning to today, right, the, the issues of the moment. 50% um, of funding is coming from the state of Tennessee based on the state's um, basic education program uh, that's statu statutorily driven. 30% for both districts is coming from Shelby County property taxes. Mm -hmm. These are taxes paid by Memphians and non-Memphians alike to the county commission and distributed based on student population. So uh, I've taken it off of here, but um, essentially, the Memphis City Schools currently has 2.2 times as many students as the Shelby County Schools. 255 is 2.2 times 115. So that's how the Shelby County Commission um, distributes its funds. In addition, the County Commission takes in sales tax money that gets distributed in the same way. Here, City of Memphis property tax. So Memphians currently pay in addition to the county property tax for schools, they pay a city property tax for schools. Um, that number goes to the city of Memphis, and the city of Memphis distributes it um, down to the school system. It makes up about 10% of the revenues um, for the city school system. If you recall, um, on that number in particular, uh, several years ago, the city council attempted to stop paying that money to the um, Memphis city schools, but that uh, was, was 
rule is not permissible by uh, the Supreme Court of Tennessee. Okay, so how is where we are now similar, and how is where we are now different from where we've come from? Um, the first similarity is the concept that tying the fates of two populations together is the way to ensure equity. So in the desegregation context, the, the idea was if you tie the fate of the African American student and the white student together, that is the way to ensure that all students receive equitable educational opportunities. So too, in the consolidation um, context, that is the idea, at least in equitable funding. Um, the concept is if we tie the fate of the Memphis City student with the Shelby County student, that is the way to achieve equity in, equity in educational opportunity. In addition, you, see, you hear echoes of some of the themes that you heard in the desegregation uh, context. We have separate and unequal schooling, right? So. Um, People look at the demographics and the achievement levels of the city and county school systems and say, well, clearly they're separate, right? They're separate because there's this um, line, the border between them, and they're unequal. Um, it's not as cut and dry as that, but I think that's one of the themes that you see um, put forth in, this, in the school con consolidation um, argument. In addition, you hear, just as you did and in fact saw in the desegregation during uh, busing, you see um, threats of disengagement and departure from the system. So um, the thought that, that just as students left them at the city school system to attend private schools or county schools in, during the desegregation era, so too perhaps now um, some students will depart and disengage from public education in Shelby County as a result of consolidation. But it's different. It's not the same. The first thing is we don't have the district court overseeing what's going on. So there is no court mandate that there be some sort of integration. Um, in addition, the separation, right, the separation involved in separate and unequal, though it has a racial element, the actual legally imposed separation is geographic. There are boundary lines that are geographic. They have um, certainly racial elements, but they are not racial lines. That has a potential constitutional um, difference. And in addition, it's different in that on some level, the goal of desegregation was ensuring not only tying the fates together, but ensuring that students from different places would be sitting next to each other in classrooms. Um, that does not seem to be any part of the conversation about consolidation today. There's no thought that we should be having a situation where city school students and county school students come together in a, in a single place. Uh, there's no appetite for busing county school students into uh, Melrose and Melrose students out to Collierville or whatever. Um, that's just not on the table and uh, instead, the, so rather than student integration, we're talking about governance and funding. Um, so that's what's, um, that's, it's different. Similar but different. So why, do, why change what we have now? And I, I make the case that there's um, separate interests driving the behavior of the, the two sort of primary actors here, um, the Shelby County Schools and their ad advocates on their behalf, and the Memphis City Schools and advocates on their behalf. Uh, the Shelby County Schools' primary interest is continuing, continuing their local control. Currently, the Shelby County Schools is populated by non-Memphians, and it's governed by non-Memphians. Um, they would like for that to, the non-Memphians would like, or those who say there should be no consolidation would like for that to remain the case. The Memphis City Schools' primary um, motivating interest here is sustainability and funding. Uh, the thought being uh, that lack of sustainability and funding results in poor educational um, results for Memphis City School students. So what strategies are being employed to pursue